thought we, today it would be nice to talk about uh, Who Am I, Bhagavan's text. Um, and in case any of you uh, don't know the full story behind it, I'll just say very briefly. In about 1901 or 1902, Shiv Kashi Play came to Bhagavan. And um, at that time, Bhagavan was mostly keeping quiet. He was talking a little, but not much. So most of the answers that Bhagavan gave to his questions, he wrote either on the slate or on, on the sand. Um, and she and Play noted down his uh, answers. Um, and the first question he asked Bhagavan was, who am I? And Bhagavan simply answered, Arive Na, which means knowledge or consciousness alone is I. And then the next question was, uh, what is the, which he can play asked, was, uh, what is the nature of Aribu, the knowledge that he says I? And Bhagavan replied, Aribin Sarupam Satchidanandam, the nature of, um, of that knowledge is Satchidananda, being consciousness bliss. And then over succeeding days or weeks or months, Shri Prakash Play asked many other questions and he noted down the answers. And about um, 20 years later, he, in, from his notebooks we can see he had compiled various drafts of, um, of the answers. And um, <coughs> In 1923, I think it was, a um, uh, uh, biography of Bhagavan that he had written in the Tamil verse was published. And in that, there was a small excerpt of, um, of what Bhagavan had told him, taught him at that time. And he also gave a, a small appendix at the end, giving um, 13 of the questions and answers. <coughs> And that immediately kindled interest among devotees. So they asked him if there's more things that he had um, recorded. So then a small book was published with 32 questions and answers. And that was in about 1924 or so. <coughs> and um, within a year or so, that became so popular. Um, Bhagavan himself wrote it, rewrote the whole thing in the form of an essay the, to the substance of what Bhagavan uh, said. First he says, um, if the mind which is the cause of all um, dualistic knowledge and all activity subsides, uh, the perception of the world will cease. Um, just as knowledge of the rope, which is the base, will not arise unless knowledge of the imaginary snake ceases, um, a true knowledge of self, that Swarupa Dashana, uh, which is the base, will not, uh, or the base that is the, um, the underlying base of all this world appearance, will not arise unless perception of the world, which is an imagination, ceases. Um, so there he gives a, the analogy of the, the snake, just like the, the imaginary snake, we, we, see, we see a rope, we mistake it to be a snake. To be, sorry, yeah, we see a rope and mistake it to be a snake. But the world is like the snake, it's just an imaginary superimposition. It doesn't really exist. All that exists is the rope. That rope is, is uh, self. So in order to see the rope, we have to remove the illusion that it's a, a snake. So also to experience ourself, we have to remove the illusion of this world. Because what we are seeing in the world is actually nothing but our own self. Um, but however much we scrutinize the things outside, we'll never experience ourselves. We have to turn away from all these things because they're a false appearance, to know the essence of everything which is within us, which is the I. Once we realize, once we experience uh, the true nature of the I within us, everything becomes that. In other words, everything disappears and that alone remains. Um, <clears throat> then in the next paragraph he begins to deal with what is the, the cause of all our problems, which is this thing we call mind. Uh, and he says, um, what is called mind is, an, is a wonderful power that exists in Atma Sarupa, that's in our essential self. Uh, 
it projects all thoughts. When, when one removes all thoughts and sees, there's no such thing as mind remaining, solid, uh, remaining on its own. That is, other than thoughts, there's no such thing as mind, is what he's saying. Um, uh, so if, if we set aside all thoughts and see what remains, that is, um, uh, there's, no such thing as, uh, there's no such thing as mind, all that remains is I, which is our real self. Therefore, thought alone is the uh, nature of the mind, the basic nature of the mind. Except thoughts, there is separately no such thing as a world. That is all that we, we imagine that there's a world outside, but we're seeing it through our eyes, hearing it through our ears, etc. But actually, all that we are experiencing is only a, a series of mental impressions. Both mental impressions, by the one says they're only thoughts. There's no such thing as a world other than our own thoughts. Um, this, for many people, is a quite a quite a difficult thing to <laughs> to uh, digest. It's something philosophers have talked about for ages. How do we know if there's any world existing independent of the mind? Philosophers in all cultures have been um, have been questioning this, but philosophy can't give any answers because philosophy can't take us beyond the mind. But Bhagavan shows us a way to go beyond the mind. And Bhagavan says these things as these are all to help us in the path, to help us free our mind from attachment to external things. But Bhagavan doesn't say believe these things. In fact, he says believing all these things is useless because um, it's the mind that believes things. The mind disappears in sleep, it disappears in death. It's a mind itself is a, um, a transient thing. So any belief that the mind has is of no substantial value. The only benefit in at least tentatively believing what Bhagavan has told us here is that we, we can then use that uh, tentative belief to direct our attention in the way Bhagavan told us to direct it, which is to know ourselves. That's the whole purpose of all this uh, philosophy. Um, Uh, so he said, except thoughts, there is separately no such thing as world. In sleep there are no thoughts, and consequently there is no world. In waking and dream there are thoughts, and consequently there is also a world. Um, Bowman considered the world, the experience in dream, to be no more real or no less real than this world. It's all, according to Bowman, just a mental projection. Um, this is Bhagavan's experience, but he says you have to make it your own experience, otherwise all, knowing all this is a, not going to be of much use to you. Mind as what rises in this body as I, that alone is mind. That is the feeling, uh, we all have a feeling of I, we feel that I within the body and we feel the body is I. That is, the, because the mind can rise only by grasping this body and taking it to the eye, not that the body exists without the mind, the mind rises and projects a body which it uh, then identifies as I. Um, that which thus rises and identifies, projects a body, a body and identifies it as I, that is the mind. If we investigate in what place the thought I rises first in the body, we will come to know that it rises in heart. That's in the innermost core of our being. Some people mistake this sentence because Bhagavan says, if we investigate in what place, they immediately think of a place in the body. But Bhagavan uses the word place in Tamil, idam, in a very idiomatic way. In some, later on he says, the place where there's no thought I is self. So uh, where he uses uh, place here, we should understand the, the state or the, the, the reality uh, is what he's talking about. And when he says we will come to know that place is the heart, that the mind rises in the heart, the heart doesn't mean a location in the body. Heart means the core of our being. But one often says the heart is self. It's not on the right or the left or up or down. It is what really is. And then he gives another practical clue. Even if we remain thinking, I, I, it will take us and leave us in that place. Um, uh, 
that is, many people have difficulty at first knowing how to practice self-inquiry, how to focus the attention on I. So Bowman says, this is a very simple clue, Bowman says, even if you go on thinking I, 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 you'll, that will draw your attention towards what that word denotes. If I say dog, immediately an image of a dog comes to our mind. If I say a book, an object comes to our mind. So also when we say I, it denotes something, it denotes a particular feeling in us, a particular consciousness in us. So by, uh, if we find it difficult at first to grasp how to attend only to I, Bhagavan says even if we remain thinking I, I, it will draw our attention back to that place, to the heart, to what we really are. <coughs> and then in the next sentence he says, of all the thoughts that appear in the mind, the thought I alone is the first thought. This, these words, the thought I alone is the first thought, he put in bold type. Um, and he repeats the same sentence later on. This is a very um, important teaching of his. The mind, there are so many thoughts in the mind, but the root of all the thoughts, the, the word he uses, the, when he says first thought, he says mudul ennam, uh, or mudul ninibu here. Um, mudul means not only first, it means what is primal, basic, original, and also what is causal. God is sometimes called mudul, the first, in the sense that he is uh, not only the origin of the world, but he's also the prime cause of the world. So, so but Bhagavan says the prime cause of everything is actually only this thought I, this, um, this, and the, the difference between the thought I and the real I is the thought I is when the pure consciousness I attaches itself to a body and experiences the body as I, that is what Bhagavan calls the thought I. And that thought I is the subject, the thinker, that thinks all other thoughts. So no other thought can exist without this first thought I. Uh, he says, only after this rises do other thoughts rise. Only after the first person appears do the second and third persons appear. Without the first person, the second and third persons do not exist. Here, first person means I, second and third person means everything else. Um, but one often uses this terminology, first person, second person, and third person. Uh, this is the paragraph where he first comes down to really um, talking about the practice. And this paragraph also is something that people often misunderstand, and it's very easy to misunderstand it from the English translations. Because um, the word, uh, one word that one uses here is vichara, vicharami, and he uses it both as a noun and as a verb. So if we, if that's translated correctly as, in, as a noun investigation, as a verb investigate, then it won't give room to the wrong meaning that some people have taken. But some people take it, have translated it as inquire. Well, inquiry and investigation is essentially the same. But the problem with the word inquiry, it has a connotation of, we also inquire, we say, use inquire when we ask a question. But one here isn't asking, talking about asking questions. <coughs> He's talking about actually investigating. So when he says, if we investigate, who am I? He doesn't mean that we sit there asking ourselves the question, who am I? Because that's just, who am I? The words who am I are just a thought. What he means is, if we investigate who am I, if we, if we investigate what we really are. So in this paragraph he begins by saying, only by means of the investigation of who am I will the mind subside. And the word he uses for subside can have many meanings. It can include both temporary subsidence and also in this context it also means the the absolute subsidence of the mind, the total destruction of the mind. So that will happen only by means of its inquiry, who am I? That is because, so long as we attend to anything other than I, our mind is going outwards, and all the world appears, thoughts appear, therefore self doesn't appear. In order to experience self as it really is, <coughs> we have to withdraw our attention from all other things, and the only way to withdraw our attention from all other things is to focus it on I. 
When we focus it on I, the mind subsides. When we focus it on anything else, the mind rises and becomes active. And because we have a thought that's constantly distracting us, we have to keep on drawing our attention back to I. And Bhagavan gives a, um, gives a, a clue for how we can do it. Though he describes this process in words, once we have got accustomed to the process, it's no longer to go through the verbalized steps. But anyway, how he describes it in words is, if other thoughts rise, it is necessary, without trying to complete them, to investigate to whom they've occurred. Then he says, without trying to complete them. If we pay attention to thoughts, the thought will just sweep us away. So we shouldn't try to follow any thought. We shouldn't uh, try to complete any thought. As soon as a thought arises, we should try to investigate to whom has it, uh, uh, to whom has this thought occurred. And um, uh, when we um, oh, I can miss one bit there. Okay. Um, uh, Oh, oh yeah, okay, how, okay, yes, yeah, sorry, I haven't missed it. In the next sentence, he says, however many thoughts have arise, what does it matter? As soon as each thought appears, if we, if we vigilantly investigate to whom it has occurred, it will be clear that it is for me. Um, if we thus investigate who am I, our mind will return to its birthplace, that is the core of our being. Um, the place from which it arose. So, um, it, some people find it helpful at first when the thought arises, oh, to whom has it risen? To me, who am I? They find it useful to think, think it through in steps, but um, that's helpful at first, but it's not really necessary. And that's not what Bhagavan is saying, that we should continue repeating the words all the time. It just means as soon as any thought arises, it should remind us no thought can arise without us being there to think it and us being there to experience it. So the existence of any thought or any perception or anything should remind us of us, our own existence. So we should, whatever we see, whatever we hear, whatever we think, should remind us that we are there and that we should be attending to ourselves. That's basically what I want to say. So we should, anything that appears to distract us, instead of allowing it to distract us, we should use it to remind us that we are there to experience it, so who am I? I attend to I, try to find out what is this I who is experiencing all these things. He said, only to this state of thus just being does the name Jnana Drishti apply. And Jnana Drishti means, um, literally it means knowledge sight. It's, um, it basically it means the experience of true knowledge. But as he explains later on, it's misinterpreted popularly by many people in many different ways. But no one said the only, the real meaning of Jnana Drishti, the experience of true knowledge, is only just being still, remaining in silence, remaining in self, without thinking anything else. Um, and then he defines what is the state of just being or simo uh, Just being or simo irupadu is only the state of making our mind uh, subside in self, in Atmasvarupa. So that only that state where the mind is completely subsided in self, that is the state of just being. So just being is, is, is another uh, way of describing both the practice of self-inquiry and the state, the attainment of self-knowledge. Both are the state of being, just being. The words who am I are just a, a description of that state of self-investigation. We can't investigate, if you, if you want to investigate what's in this book, you have to look inside. You can't just say what is in this book, what is in this book, you're not, you're not going to know. When you look inside, you can, you can see and read it, then you know what's inside. So also, <coughs> to investigate <coughs> who am I, we have to look at this eye, see what it is. So that state of looking at eye, of being self-aware, that is the state of self of inquiry, and that is the state of uh, of sumayiru, just being. There's absolutely no difference. 
if, if you do any other type of meditation, you're thinking of something other than I. In fact, any spiritual practice other than self other than self inquiry is an attention paid to something other than I. Whether you're doing pranayama or you're meditating or any type of spiritual practice. So many different types of meditation are there. They say to meditate on different places in the body, to meditate on thought of God. It's all attention to something other than I. <coughs> this is where the teaching, what Bhagavan has taught us, the path of self-inquiry, is fundamentally different to every other type of spiritual practice. Because so long as we're attending to anything other than I, the mind is active. In fact, we're feeding the mind. We, the only benefit we can get from other sadhanas is we can free the mind from its grosser forms of attachment. We can gain chitta suddhi, purity of mind. It is actually so, so simple, the path Bhagavan has taught us. Our mind complicates things. Our mind is complicated, so we make even the simplest thing complicated. <coughs> But what can be simpler than knowing oneself? Self-inquiry, but he didn't know it in terms of self-inquiry. He didn't know there was a name for it. All he knew, very an intense fear of death. Yeah. Who is dying? Am I going to die with, the, with this body? That was all. Non-existence is just an idea. That's it why, doesn't exist. Yeah, it doesn't so exist. There's no, birth, there is no such thing as non-existence. Yeah. It's, it's just an idea. All exactly. these things are just ideas. Who has all these ideas? That's what we want to know. If we find out who it is who is experiencing all these ideas about life, death, existence, non-existence, if we experience that, then everything is answered. I think it is probably true for most of us in this room. We, we all have a relatively fairly easy life. If you compare our, the life we are each living to the life of many people in the present age and in past ages, we aren't anyone's slave, we have relative freedom, we have, I mean in so many ways our life is actually very cushy. But this is, this is, this benign state we're in is actually a deception. Sometimes um, People make more progress spiritually when they're in really adverse conditions, when they're really suffering. Yeah. So we should not let the um, <laughs> benign nature of our present existence deceive us. <laughs> we, though we shouldn't embrace other things, we should accept other things. We should not. We should not. Um, we should not react against other things, whether we whether pleasure or pain comes in our life. We should treat it, we should view it all with equanimity. We should not be overly attached to the pleasures. We should just not be overly averse to the pains. But observe it. Just not even observe being, it. Being, being Don't even being. observe it, because observing it again, you're feeding the mind. That's it. Ignore it. Yeah. Ignore it. Ignore it, yes. yes. It, it, <laughs> ignorance is the key. The medicine of ignorance is ignorance. <laughs> but ignoring the non-self is the, is the medicine for our ignorance of self. Actually, the, the truth is, there is no jnani in this world except one. And that one is you. There is no other jnani at all. Because everyone else is just your mental projection. So if you want to find jnana, you have to find it in yourself. People, people take this world to be real. But Bowen, because they, we don't have a very high standard, of, a very high definition of reality, Bowen gives a very strict definition of reality. If something is real, it has to be always real. It can't be real one time, not real at another time. It has to be absolutely real, so that at all times, in all places, it can't change at all. Because if it changes, it was one thing at one time, another thing at another time, which was real. So, so it, yeah. it has to be eternal, it has to be unchanging. And the third most important uh, characteristic of, um, of reality that Bowen gave is it has to be self-shining. It has to know its own existence. What do you know that knows its own existence? I. I. Apart That's from that, it. nothing else <laughs> knows its own existence. Only I know I knows its own existence. Because it, it, Why all this world appears real? 
because it's a projection of the mind, and the mind appears to be real. Why does the mind appear to be real? Because we give it reality. By identifying ourselves with the mind, by taking ourselves to be the mind, we make the mind real, appear real, and thereby we make everything else appear real. If we withdraw ourselves from this whole show, none of it is real. So the only element of reality in all that we experience is I. Other than I, nothing is real. Other things are temporary, they come and they go. In sleep, they all disappear. All that we're talking about is ideas. Consciousness is an idea, there's, uh, photography is an idea, it's all ideas. Who is experiencing all this? It's all, we are talking about what is experienced. We are not talking about the experience now. What we, we have to cease being interested in any type of experience and be interested in only in knowing who is the experiencer. That is the only way out of this. That's why Bhagavan says it's not stopping the mind or controlling thoughts. That's not our aim. Our aim is knowing who we are. The only, the only reason why thoughts are an issue is they distract our attention. In fact, they, they, they themselves are the sign of our attention distracted away from self. So, we should ignore them and try to know who we are. Yes. That solves the problem of the... If we ignore them, the problem is solved. The problem exists only because we don't ignore them. We have to experience it, but what is the reality of that which is now experiencing all this? And no words can answer that. No thought can answer that. Only the experience can answer it. Yes, what is it? You, yes, you can't answer. Yeah. But, but it sounds like when you say I, we give I a location here. Yes. I, here, right? We need not give I a location anywhere. But that's a mistake. Isn't it? So long as the mind exists, it appears that I is here, not here. Right. So we have to turn our attention towards here, towards I. But that's, that's all, all part of the fabric of this illusion called mind. But the way to, to pierce through this fabric is to attend to I. Attending to anything else is really just uh, sustaining the fabric. So it, it is... And we don't know where that's... We don't know where that's going to lead. We have to give up anything. Who doesn't know? <laughs> we, we, we have to be... It, it, because, well, why I say that now? Because it's very easy when we talk about these things. If you observe our conversation, we keep on going off on tangents. Mm. We keep on talking about what is experience, what is... All this is irrelevant. The only thing that is relevant is I. Experiencing I here and now, that's the only thing that is required. Anything else is a distraction. The more we think about it, the more complicated it seems. But actually, it's so, so simple. If we cease thinking about it, it would be patently obvious how simple it is. Do we have to take your word for it? It's so simple. No, you don't. You have to experience it. My word is no use to me or to you. If we have to experience it, we have to give you... It may be, maybe Bhagavad's teachings are just a myth, maybe it's just part of our dream, maybe there's nothing in it, but at least we can try. We've got nothing else worth trying. <laughs> Bhagavan doesn't ask us to believe him. He asks us to try it out and see for ourselves. Philosophy, it is a concept, but uh, it's a it's a philosophy that is pointing in a particular direction. We shouldn't get caught up in the words or the ideas of the philosophy. We should get caught up in the direction it is pointing to. If you read any part of Bhagavan's teachings, it is constantly pointing in just one direction, and that is towards us. So the whole pur purpose of the philosophy, the ph philosophy can never reveal the truth. But philosophy can point the way, can show us where we can find the truth, and that is within ourselves.
state we're experiencing <laughs> appears real at the time we're experiencing it. Mm. My father has died in this waking state, but in dream I may meet my father. When I meet him in dream, it is real. Even though I said, oh, I thought he was dead. Even though the thought occurs to me, obviously he's not, because there he is in front of me. So we, we all have experiences like that in dream. So it's, uh, it, it's, all, it's all in the mind. And so we should try to find out what is this mind that is able to experience in so many things.